of my King with the song of love to the faint and low in the service of my King. Well, in the service of my King. Well, in the service of my King. It is glory, joy beyond compare in the service of my King. Just a kindly or a song of prayer in the service of my King that the lost may turn and his glory share in the service of my King well in the service of my King worship service and uh, we want to welcome those that are here in the auditorium and we also want to welcome huh? uh, uh, they working on the microphone test one two three test one can you hear me now let me try it again good morning good morning good morning to you all you're looking good you sounding good and we want to welcome you to our 10 a.m. worship service doing things a little bit different. I wanted to say this on this morning. Psalm 95, 6 and 7 says, Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are his people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Amen. With that in mind, let us say a word of prayer. Our Lord and our most high God, we are once again thankful. Thankful that you've given us another opportunity to come out and worship you in spirit and in truth, dear Father. Dear Father, we ask that you be with us as we go through this worship service. Help us to do the things that you would have us to do. We pray for those that are on their way. We pray for those that are here with us on today and that you just continue to bless this worship service. It's always in your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Beautiful robe, so white, beautiful land of light, beautiful home, so bright, where there shall come no night, beautiful cry. Oh, 
beautiful band Well, and with you beautiful crowd Oh, shining so fair Yes, beautiful man Just bright, gather us there Beautiful thing Thus I shall leave this shore, counting my treasures, oh, where we shall never die, carry me by, and by never to sorrow. Beautiful band, beautiful crown, oh, shining so bright. Yeah, beautiful man, just bright. Gather us there, oh, beautiful robe. Yeah. A lot of times in our lives, we allow our minds to run away with us when all we have to do is take it to King Jesus. When I should feel so sad, why does my heart feel so glad? Why does my soul feel so happy and gay when all around me burdens roll yet I'm not worried at all for when I pray King Jesus will roll my burdens away will roll my burdens away when I pray for he'll open doors for me doors I'm unable to see for when I pray King Jesus will roll my burdens away Like a king on his throne, I'm never left all alone. I have a friend, and he walks with me each day. And all he is asked me to do, keep his word and be true for in I pray 
King Jesus will roll my burdens away. All the way, all the way, King Jesus will roll my burdens away when I pray. will roll your burdens away. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this avenue of prayer. You are an awesome God. You are creator of the heavens and the earth. You are the creator, Lord, of the stars that are in the sky and the moons. We thank you, Lord, for creating us. By your word, you have set in motion the laws of physics and chemistry, biology. And as smart as we are, as, as advanced and technologically advanced as we are, Lord, we only understand just a speck of those laws. And we know, Lord, that you are all powerful. And no, how, no matter how smart we think we are, we're nothing compared to you and your knowledge, Lord. And you knew us, Lord, since we were in our, womb, in, in our mother's wombs. You knew everything about us. And you loved us way back when, Father. And we thank you for that love. You sent your son as part of a plan for us to be reconciled to you way back when we were first formed, Lord. And we thank you for that. We thank you for that plan. We pray, Lord, that you will just be with us this morning. We thank you, Father, for us being able to wake up be in our right minds, for us to have breath, air to breathe. We thank you, Lord, for the food that we have in our refrigerators. We thank you for the food we have in our pantries. We thank you, Lord, for so much. Our words cannot begin to thank you for all the things that you have done for us, Father. And Lord, we pray for those who are among us, Lord, who don't have that food in their pantry, who are on hard times. Bring those needs out for us, Lord. Give us that caring spirit to rally around our brothers and sisters, Lord, and to help them. We pray, Father, for the church, which is made up of all these different families, Father, strangers who 
have only gotten to know each other through you. We thank you for that. We pray, Lord, for the relationships here in this church. That we can grow and love on each other like you would have us to do. So that we can truly look at each other and call ourselves brothers and sisters. We thank you for that opportunity, Lord, every Sunday that we come here, every time we assemble, to get to know each other, to get to edify each other and encourage one another. And we pray, Lord, that we take that not just on Sunday, Father, but beyond Sunday, on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, Father, encouraging each other, loving each other. Pray, Lord, for the leadership in the congregation, Father, the elders and their wives, their families. May, may their families grow strong, Lord, so that their leadership can be strong, so that they can lead us with wisdom, Father. We pray the same for the deacons, the teachers, the ministry leaders, all who serve in this congregation, we pray that, Lord, that you would just be with them and their families and just strengthen them. Pray for our preacher, Father. We pray for his family, his health. We pray for his spiritual health, Father, as he proclaims your word and teaches us and as we grow closer to you. We pray, Lord, for the church and our growth here at the church. Numerical growth, Father. We pray, Lord, that we take your word out into Austin and really just let it marinate in the hearts of folks out there and let it pricks their hearts and that they come to this congregation, Lord, and that we grow in number and let our numbers reflect Austin, reflect the diversity that's in Austin. Black, white, Hispanic, Asian, whatever is out there, Lord, let them be reflected in this congregation and let our numbers grow. And we pray for, for not just numerical growth, Father, but for growth of each member in maturity in you. Lord, please, please, just allow us to mature to love each other as you would have us love. Get rid of any division that's in us, Lord, so that we can grow together and become powerful one on one accord and do your will, Father. We pray, Lord, for forgiveness of sin. Sin is in throughout in our lives, as long as we're human, Father, we know that we will falter, that we will fall short. And we pray for your forgiveness, Father. Pray that everyone repents, Father, so that there is nothing that will hinder us from coming and growing, drawing closer to you this day and in our days ahead, Father. And we thank you for that ability to come to you. Uh, and ask for forgiveness. We thank you for your son Jesus who died on the cross, whose blood continuously cleanses us, Father. We thank you for that. We pray, Lord, that you will be with us throughout this morning and throughout the service. Be with the preacher who's going to preach. Be with our each person in here, our hearts, open our hearts to receive your word, Father. And let us praise you, Father, the way you deserve to be praised. It is in Jesus' name that we all pray. Amen. When we reach that city of the new Jerusalem, we'll sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. All the ransom singers will together lift that hymn. Well, we'll sing, we'll sing, by and by. Oh, and oh, what joy when we get home. 
Well, we'll rest beneath that cloudless dome Oh, and in that land where saints never die Oh, we'll sing, we'll sing And by will and in the mighty chorus voices will so sweetly blend Well, we'll sing, we'll sing By and by Well, a gone will be our sadness Pleasures there will never end Oh, we'll sing, we'll sing By and by Oh, and oh, what joy sing, we'll sing, by and by, we'll praise in our Redeemer there beside the crystal stream, oh, we'll sing, we'll sing, by and by, oh, and oh, a joy. do something a little different this morning. Can you hear me fine? All right. We're going to do something other than this is the day that the Lord hath made. All right. Make a joyful shout to the Lord. All ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endures to all generations. Amen and amen. Go ahead and be seated. What a wonderful psalm. That's Psalm 100. Most of you probably recognized it, but what a beautiful thought. It is one that calls on us to worship the Lord and to come into his place with an attitude of gratitude and an attitude of worship. And gratitude often inspires worship. 
when you are thankful for what God has done, then it calls forth praise giving to God. It's good to be here this morning and to see those who have come. And certainly we want to say to those who led us this morning, we appreciate you so very much for leading us in our worship service. I want to ask at this moment that we have our visitors to stand. And if you are visiting with us, please stand. And we'd ask you to remain standing until we have you to sit down. If you are a visitor, and I know you may not like to stand, but we'd ask you to do it. All right. God bless you. Amen. Stand on your feet. Thank you so very much. Now, we want you to know that you are indeed our honored guests. We thank you for coming. We want you to know that you are among friends and not enemies. And we trust that you will give us a chance to greet you once this service has ended. And we want to ask you now to stay standing, and we're going to ask Eastside to stand, and let's welcome them in an Eastside way with a standing ovation. Thank you. Thank you very much. God bless you. Go ahead and be seated. I want you to know that's not just done for perfunctory, but we do love to have you come because we know that you have choices. You could have gone anywhere this morning, but you chose to come and be with us, and that makes us feel very good. Thank you. God bless you. Now, I'm not going to say a whole lot about this now. I know that we're going to say something about it at the end of service, but also we have designated this month We Care Group Month. Our elders are trying to shepherd the flock. They're really putting forth a great effort to shepherd the flock. And one of the emphasis uh, in doing that, one of the things that they're trying to do is get the care groups together. Uh, and each one will have meetings this throughout this month. And today there will be some who will go, and the, the elders will tell you which ones will go. Uh, only two, I remember, if I remember correctly, will go this morning to the education facility when this is over. And it's not a meeting uh, in the sense of you're coming to get information. It's basically to let you see who's in your care group. To just basically say these are your care group members. And to meet and to greet one another, to try to break down some of those walls so you'll actually know who's in your care group. So if we care, then we need to know who we're caring about. Amen. Amen. And so we're working on that. We're trying to do better. That's all we can do. You always should strive to do better. Amen. Amen. Look, if you will, at James chapter 1 as we continue to talk about this issue with communication. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Verses 19 and 20. And it will be on the screen for those who perhaps may not have your Bibles with you. Uh, James chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. I've talked about, two weeks ago, I began to talk about the triad of communication etiquette. And so we're going to talk about the triad of communication etiquette part two. And so this morning we want to conclude this message, Lord willing. It is humanly impossible to have a good, healthy, meaningful, happy relationship of any sort in any arena of life without having good communication skills, without having good communication etiquette, without having good communication. Communication has been called the lifeblood of a relationship. It is to the relationship what blood is to the body. Without blood, the body dies. And without good communication, relationships die. There would be no world, there would be no universe, no life, no existence without communication. 
that truth is firmly established in Genesis chapter 1. Nothing happened in the blackness of nothingness until God said, let there be light. God spoke and suddenly light came into existence and nothing became something. The point is, the spoken word brought all, brought all life that is life into existence. The Hebrews writer said it like this in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 3. By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command. That what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. Theologians often use the Latin word ex nihilo, meaning out of nothing to describe what happened in Genesis chapter 1. In other words, God created the world out of nothing. God spoke it into existence. And all I'm trying to show you is simply this. Nothing happened until God spoke. And nothing good will happen in your relationship or relationships until you learn how to communicate with each other. Like it or not, life and communication are eternally bound to one another. Now, this is not just true, and I'm talking about, of course, even when we get to heaven, we'll be communicating, but there'll never be a problem with communication. But now, in this world, we must learn how to, com to communicate. And let me say this, because everything that I say primarily, not, maybe not every single thing, but most of the things that I will say primarily not only can be related to marriage, but it can be related to brothers and sisters in Christ because we have relationships within the body. We are the family of God. And so when I talk about communication, don't just look at this from the vantage point of, well, this is only for the married couples. This is for not only those who are married, but for those who just are in relationships. And basically, that's all of us. If you don't communicate effectively, and I, I emphasize effectively because we are communicating one way or the other. If we don't communicate effectively, then I want you to understand that your spouse or your marriage is doomed to your spouse and your marriage is doomed to die. And understand that a relationship can die without you ever getting a divorce or legally separating from one another. Stay with me if you will. You can live in the same house, in the same space, eat at the same table, sit on the same couch, watch the same movies, sleep in the same bed, share the same bank account, ride to worship in the same automobile, share your clothes closet, and yet your relationship can be dead, devoid of all vitality, affection, intimacy, meaningfulness, and love. You are just coexisting and cohabitating for the sake of appearance. And some people do that. They just simply say, well, I know you don't like me and I don't like you, but we, we just might as well stay together. I mean, we've been together this long, we just might as well keep doing it. In fact, it costs too much money to divorce you anyhow. You know that old song, it's cheaper to keep her, it's cheaper to keep him. So, you know, we can just do what we need to do. You stay in your space, I'll stay in my space, or we just share the space, but we have no relationship and we understand that. And there are some people who live like that, and no doubt some of you are living like that right now. You're existing in a relationship, but for all practical purposes, the relationship is dead. There is no joy, there is no happiness, there is no intimacy. There is no love, there is no romance, there is just existence. And you only talk to one another when necessary, never beyond. Good morning. Good night. Did you pay this bill? The car needs gas. What's for dinner? The children need this. But beyond that surface level chatter, 
There is nothing beneath the surface of the surface that you are sharing about yourself. You are not sharing your heart. You are not sharing your emotions, your thoughts, your dreams, your feelings, your hurts, your pains, your joys, your fears, your desires, your hopes, your plans for life. You're not sharing any of that because you are simply on the surface because you don't feel comfortable and you don't feel like you can be vulnerable to the person that you're married to. That's unfortunate. But there are people who live in relationships like that. I, I, I know, and you know, usually when I talk about things that I know, I make sure that I'm talking about people in other churches. <laughs> Amen. Because <laughs> I don't want you trying to figure out who I'm talking about. So I'm always talking about someone that has never been a part of East Side. Because I do counsel people outside of East Side in other congregations. So I do, do, do that. And so I do want you to understand that I know a couple right now that has been married for 30 years, but they say we've been single for 30 years. Married but single. And there are people like that in the church. I'm not talking about people in the world. People in the church who know what God's word says, yet they live as strangers in that relationship other than the perfunctory stuff. And church, that's sad because God intended for our marriages to be a source of comfort. He intended for us to be vulnerable with one another. To have someone that I could share my heart with, my hopes and my pains, my dreams, to be totally me. You ought to be able to be yourself. I know that you will be accepted for who you are. That verse that says, perfect love cast out fear. That is but to say that if you have the kind of relationship in your home that you can say that my wife, that my husband loves me so much that I know that I don't have to fear them seeing me at my worst. And I'm not talking about crazy stuff. You know, I'm not talking about no cussing folk out and hitting them violent, being violent and all of that stuff. I'm, talk, I'm just talking about your worst in the sense that it's still within the realm of what's reasonable. Okay? But when you see a person at his worst or at, his, at her worst, you can still say, I love you in spite of you because it's not that surface love, it is that agape love that is unconditional. God wants us to have that kind of relationship. And if you're existing together without any meaningful communication, then I want you to know that your relationship is on life support or is dead. Remember that there were several levels, several levels of communication. This is just a review right here. There are several levels of communication. If you don't mind, put those up. Because some people stay at level one in their relationships. And if you can pull that up, Brandon, we'll just go ahead and pull that up. Level one, small talk. Level one is small talk. What you think about the weather? You know, what's for dinner? It's just on the surface stuff. It's just, I got to exist with you. So these are the things we need to talk about to exist together. All right? We got to do more than just grunt. Mm. All right? Level two. Some of you move past level one, you're at level two. Facts and information. Impersonal, objective information. Did you hear the news? What was the score of the game? Well, you're just asking a few questions. Level three, opinions and beliefs. Now you're getting down further into this process called communication. Opinions matter. I think this, this is how I see it. These are my thoughts on the matter. 
And so basically when you get here, at least you'll start, you're starting to get beneath the surface and you're starting to ask a person for how they feel or think about a situation. Some of you may be there. Level four. This is the level of feelings and emotions. This is the level where you share how you feel about a particular topic. You have developed a level of trust here. So right now you're saying that I can trust you enough to tell you my innermost feelings, how I feel about something. You're getting deeper down into the process and you have developed a level of trust that's deeper than level three. Level four, level five, needs and desires. You don't share your needs and desire with everyone. If you do, something is wrong. You just meet a stranger. Let me tell you what I need. Well, what? Let me tell you what I desire. I desire, what? I don't know you. See, that's going to make me be uncomfortable. And it's going to make you be uncomfortable. Because it suggests that I have a relationship with you that has been established to the point that you can trust me to share your needs and desire. This is the level where a person says, this is what I need, this is what I desire in life. And I'm opening my heart up farther and farther. Level six. Level six, six is peak communication. This is the level that you're trying to get to. This level involves a deep understanding and connection with the other person. Keep going if you will. And I want you to understand that we're, get, we're gonna get to that later. But when you get to this point, you're talking about deep understanding, connection with the other person. It involves active listening. We're not gonna go there right now, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. It involves active listening, empathy, and a willingness to understand the other person's perspective. This is what you need to build lasting, strong, healthy relationships. This is the level of communication you need to work out difficult problems. Amen. The point is, a deep level of heart-to-heart -heart communication is a must if relationships are going to live and thrive. The question is, what is communication? I talked about this, but I'm not going to go through all of the, the things I said last uh, week before last. But this is the one that I want to hold on to because communication theorists have several different def def definitions for communication. But the definition I prefer as it relates to personal or interpersonal relationships is this one. Communication is the act of sharing information with the intent of creating a shared understanding. So I understand, I took communication in school and I've read many books on communication. I understand the process of a sender and a receiver and between that is noise and there's the interpreter. I know all of that stuff, but I'm just talking about from a simple vantage point. When I communicate, what I'm trying to do is simply this. I am trying to get the thoughts, feelings, and emotions that I have in my head, in your head. All right? I feel a certain way. I have thoughts and emotions about what's going on. And so when I'm communicating with you, what I'm trying to do is get the thoughts and the emotions and the feelings that are on the inside of my head into your head so that you're now seeing how I feel through your eyes and you can understand now where I am and why I am where I am. Amen? So when we talk about communication, if I can boil it down to a simple statement or a simple word, it is about understanding. Sometimes our frustration comes when we say, I don't understand why they don't understand what I'm saying. This seems very simple to me. It ain't that complicated. If we have 
less money than we do month, we don't need to be buying that. It don't seem that hard. You see, that's understand. I just want, want you to understand me. Are you listening? So some colloquialisms that we usually use. Do you get me? Are we here? Are we on the same page? We use those terms. Do you feel me? Are you with me? Do you hear me? All you're simply saying is, did I get the feelings, the thoughts, and the emotions that are inside of my head that's causing me to be frustrated that I get them inside of your head so you can understand me? Are y'all with me, church? In other words, I'm trying to get the person to comprehend what I'm saying and acknowledge. Now watch this. I want them to acknowledge it. Acknowledge my feelings. Even if you don't agree. Acknowledging does not necessarily mean that you have to agree. So you need to understand that what I want you to do is first of all, hear me out. I didn't say to you, agree with me. But you might agree with me if you hear me out. <laughs> say amen if you can. <laughs> I want you to understand why I feel like I feel. I want you to understand why I believe like I believe. I want you to understand this. And you might say, well, Brother Weave, you're dealing too much with feelings. Well, how can you be married and in a relationship and not have feelings? Maybe that's the problem. Well, you're just too much in emotions. Well, that's why you don't have a relationship because you don't know how to show, express emotions. <laughs> well, you're expressing some kind of emotion, but it's not the right kind. It's that kind of emotion that says, I'm disconnected, I don't care. I'm indifferent. And so when you have that, it's basically saying, I don't care about this relationship and I'm not going to work on this relationship because I have disconnected. Basically, I need you to understand, watch this. I need you to understand, it doesn't make any difference whether this is husband or wife. I need you to understand why I feel neglected. I need you to understand why I feel unloved. I need you to understand why I feel undesirable. I need you to understand why I feel angry. I need you to understand why I'm frustrated. I need you to understand why I'm sad. I need you to understand why, I, why I'm unhappy, why I'm unappreciated, why I feel unappreciated, and why I feel disrespected. So you might come in and say, well, you know, I'm angry. Why are you angry? Because you disrespected me. And the person might say, well, when? So what I'm talking about is not just spouting out and spouting off and telling a person, you did this and made me this. I'm talking about communicating. That's talking at someone. But I'm talking about, I need you to understand Give me a moment, and I'm going to get to these in a few minutes, how we do this. I need you to understand, when you said this, and you did this, it caused me to feel disrespected. Now, you may not have intended to do that. See, because you're not going to get into intentions. I hate it. When someone tells me why I did what I did. Oh, you did that to do this. But when did you get, when did you become God? That now you know what's in my head. I may have done that, but maybe I wasn't even thinking about it and didn't realize that I did it. Oh, you did that to make me angry. Really? You did that to disrespect me. Really? I didn't even know I did it. You, you intentionally stepped on my foot. I didn't even know I stepped on it. I thought it was a shoe on the floor. 
So don't be the judge and jury. Are y'all listening to me? I want to get this stuff out of my head and into your head because I truly believe if you would understand me, our relationship would be better. And let me just say a word because I talked about appreciation. Let me just say a word about appreciation. Brothers and sisters, a little appreciation gets you a whole lot of mileage in a relationship. Listen to me carefully. There are not too many things worse than lovingly and thoughtfully doing something for someone, specifically your spouse, and he or she does not even have the common decency to say thank you. Now I know I've talked to too many folk and counseled too many people over 40 years. I know some of the common things that are said when you say that. Hmm? When you start talking about showing appreciation, well, that's my husband. That's what he's supposed to do. So why should I thank him for what he's supposed to do? Oh, I'm just talking about what I'm talking about. He's supposed to work. I agree with that. But some men don't work. So if you got one that's working, I'm working hard just to say, I really appreciate that, honey. Thank you for being such a hard worker. Well, I ain't, I ain't thanking him for that. That's his job. <laughs> Stay with me. He's supposed to wash my car. He's supposed to get my oil changed. Well, not necessarily. You know, that's Jiffy Lou. <laughs> Quick stops, all of those things. He doesn't have to take it upon himself to do it. It's, a, it's an act of love and service. And if he does it, you always say, thank you. I appreciate it. Are y'all with me? He's supposed to keep me in a new car. Yeah, maybe so. It's the right thing to do, but does it always have to be brand new? Does it have to be a 2024? Maybe it can be 2018, just since it's running well. Does it have to be the top line of the model? See, you have expectations, but are those expectations realistic? And whenever your husband does something, out of love, there ought to be gratitude. Yeah. Appreciation. Communicate that. And, you know, on the other side, on the other side, oh, she's my wife. That's what she's supposed to do. She's supposed to cook, wash, and fold clothes. Well, <laughs> some of y'all, y'all in the wrong generation. <laughs> <laughs> oh Lord have mercy cause this new generation they on another level <laughs> say amen if you can y'all know what I'm talking about see, see in our generation that's the roles I'm not saying that's the only role but women did that that was just what they did and if you got a woman that's still washing and folding clothes and cooking, brother, you need to say, thank you, sweetie. <laughs> you need to, be, you know, she ain't always running the church's chicken or Popeyes or whatever. I mean, every now and then that's going to happen. But I'm just saying, if you got a woman that's thinking about that stuff and trying to do it, you ought to say, thank you. Yeah. Uh, she's supposed to work. She's, she's a help meet. <laughs> She's supposed to help me meet the bills. Well, you're taking that out of context, but let me just say it like this. It's a wonderful thing if you have a wife who is helping you to meet the bills. But you need to understand that from a biblical perspective, that's the man's primary role. So if you got a wife that's working and bringing home the money and contributing to the house financially, brothers, every time she walked through the door, thank you, sweetie. I really appreciate what you do. 
I'm, I'm, I'm just talking about a little appreciation. A little appreciation gets you a whole lot of mileage. Don't, don't ask your wife to do something. Don't ask your spouse to do something. It goes both ways. Don't ask your spouse to do something and don't say thank you. So, have courage, courtesy, common courage. Sweetheart, do you mind passing me that book? Pass me that book. <laughs> what? You're not talking to a child. See, you're not married to a child. You're supposed to be married to your equal. Say amen if you can. Y'all may have different roles, but you're equal. Say amen if you can. So when, when you ask them for something, baby, you mind giving me this? And when they do it, say, thank you, sweetie. I appreciate that. You start getting more. More than you asked for. Amen. I didn't say what that is. I just said that's what I'm saying. Are y'all with me? Don't take your spouse for granted. Show your spouse some appreciation. Like Solomon said, it's the little foxes that spoil the vines. Brothers and sisters, for a relationship to survive and thrive, you need that intimacy level of communication where there is a meeting of the hearts and you can talk about any and everything because there's a level of deep trust between the two of you. And as I said in the previous lesson, my text, James chapter 1, verses 19 through 20, is lifted out of a larger context of hearing and obeying God's word. Listen to the text, because I want to pull this out just to show you, so I, you'll know that I know what I'm talking about as far as the context. And sometimes you, you move, when you're talking topically, you can take a text and you can go ahead with it. We're not speaking contextually, but contextually it's talking about uh, hearing the word of God. So then, my brother, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear and slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. So James is talking about hearing God's word, understanding God's word, and applying God's word to our lives. But I want to use these principles from the text because he gives us some principles about listening to the word of God, about hearing God's word. And I use these three concepts in the process of communication because he says, be slow to speak, quick to hear, and slow to anger. Let's look at it. James chapter 1 and verse number 19. James says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Now, James said, be quick or swift to hear. That simply means, listen. Be ready to listen. Be eager to listen. Be attentive to the spoken word. In other words, you ever heard that expression, being on the edge of your seat with anticipation? That is the notion. That I'm on the edge of the seat with anticipation, waiting to hear with bated breath God's word so that I can obey the word. And sure, the clause, be swift to hear, is a present active imperative. Meaning simply this, that we are always to possess the disposition to be eager to hear and obey God's word. This is not something that you do every now and then, but every time.
time you come to hear God's word, you, you need to have a disposition that says, I am ready to hear and obey and apply God's word to my life. And church, what that tells me is simply this. James is talking about an attitude adjustment. He's talking about a mental paradigm shift from one, watch this now, from one who all is always ready to talk and to be heard, but never ready to be silent and hear. You have some people like that. They want you to hear them, but they don't want to hear you. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. They will dominate the so-called conversation. But once they have told you what they feel, well, I'm through now. And what I'm saying is that you cannot have communication and you will not have a good relationship if you do all the talking and none of the listening. Amen. Say amen if you can. All right. Let's work through this. And what that means is simply this. When James says, be swift to hear, James is saying within the context of worship now, you ought to come to the worship house or the house of God or any context where God's word is being taught. You ought to come with an attitude that says, I have prepared my heart prior to coming to receive the word. I have prepared mentally and spiritually prior to coming. James said, to hear right, you must start right. And to start right, there must be some preconditioning of your heart so that it is ready to receive God's word. How many of you know anything at all about farming? Farming. Huh? You don't just go out and take the seed and just throw them on top of the ground. In a pasture full of weeds. You have to prepare the soil. I, you know, I, I, I used to see my grandfather, and we grew up, as I said, I had partially uh, a life on the farm as well as the city. And he would go out and plow the fields, go out and disc the fields, to turn up that dirt, to open it up so that it would be ready and try to get the weeds out as many as possible so that it's ready to receive the word so that the word can fall in that soil and be productive. So if you come in here and your heart is full of weeds, your head is everywhere else but on God's word, then God's word is not going to make an impact on your heart. And if you come to a relationship and come to, to communicate with a person and your mind is everywhere else but on that matter right then, communication that is productive will not take place. So when I talk about communication etiquette within this context, within the context of communication, I'm saying engaging in a conversation, in order to do that, you must mentally be ready for that conversation. And I, you remember I'm talking about different levels. I don't need to re ready myself for level one and level two. It's just, hey, man, how was your day today? It was fine. You can be cooking, you can be cleaning, you can be doing a lot of stuff, and just level one, level two stuff. But when you start talking about, I, we got issues. Now, I need to prepare my mind for this conversation. Are y'all with me? Church, I'm talking about taking this verse and simply saying this within context, I need to hear, I need to listen to comprehend, I need to respond positively to what is being said. And that's the principle that I'm trying to get you to understand within a process of communication within a relationship between a husband and wife. Just like I come in here, I should have prepared my mind to hear God's word. You should have prepared your mind to hear God's word now. So it is when you're trying to have an in-depth conversation with your spouse, you need to prepare your heart. Listen to me carefully. If we don't get rid of the negative attitudes, so that's some stuff we got to get rid of to prepare the heart to hear. Because if you got a lot of stuff going on in your marriage, and, and, those, and those anonymous words... We need to talk. 
can we talk? I got something on my mind I need to share with you. See, time you hear that, all of a sudden you get all defensive. And now you start wondering, what's going on? Blood pressure shoots up. Heart starts beating faster. Here we go again. What, what's she going to talk about this? What is she going to talk about this time? And then you start huffing and puffing. Sucking your teeth. Rolling your eyes. And when the spouse sees that, they see your nonverbal communication and automatically shut down the communication process. And then you say, well, well, well you, your wife or your husband say, that's all right, forget about it. I don't, I, well, well, why are you stopping? I didn't say anything. Yes, you did. <laughs> it was your attitude when you start sucking your teeth and puffing her. <sighs> you, told, you told your spouse, I don't want to hear you. So I'm talking about getting rid of those negative attitudes. So good communication begins before you ever start the verbal dialogue. Are y'all listening to me? It starts with you ready in your heart, adjusting your attitude to receive with meekness the heart of the other person. If you want to have communication that is impactful and effective, you must get out of yourself and come to the table with a humble and gentle spirit that's open and ready to receive what the other person says. All right? Being quick to hear necessarily means preparation to receive the communication. So not only must we rid ourselves of a negative disposition, we must prepare ourselves to hear with our hearts. I need to get rid of some stuff so I can hear. Are y'all listening? Be swift to hear. Means that you desire to hear the other person. And when you do that, it says to your spouse something. When you, when you say to your spouse, I want to hear you, when you do that, you are simply saying by that very act that I value you, that you are important to me, that you matter. Are you listening? So if you ask me, can I speak to you, brother? And I say, I don't have time for you. What you're saying is, I don't value you. I, I don't value your thoughts. You're not important to me. You don't matter. Now, if you caught me at the wrong time, that's a different issue. I might say, this is not the time that I can have this, com this, this conversation. And sometimes you have to call it. Sometimes you have to say, baby, I really want to have this conversation right now. But I need to unwind some. I'm just not in a good place mentally. And I want this conversation to be productive. So give me an hour and we'll talk. Does that work with you? Now notice you asked, does that work for you? Are you listening? Because you don't want to plow into a, into a conversation and the person is already upset about a whole lot of stuff. Maybe they had the worst day of their lives on the job. And now you want to pile some other stuff on it. You have to ask the question, is this a good time to have this conversation? Are y'all with me? I know I'm, I'm putting a lot of stuff in this. When I go through this, I usually take these things one at a time. But I don't have that kind of time in this sermon, so I'm just moving on. Brothers and sisters, when your spouse or anyone else is seeking to communicate with you, there are at least three things they want to know. Number one, they want to know I am known. In other words, I matter to you. Do I matter to you? Do I matter to you enough to give me your time? Are y'all listening? Number two, I am seen. I am not invisible. Recognize that I'm here. Okay? Number three, I am heard. My thoughts, my feelings, my voice matters. So when you listen to a person, you are simply saying to that person, you are known, you matter to me, you are not invisible, your thoughts and your feelings matter to me. And you already have the platform for good communication. Are y'all with me? James said, 
My beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. The second leg of this triad of communication of etiquette, communication etiquette, is being slow to speak. Lord have mercy. At its core, it means that you think before you open your mouth. Say with me. In other words, you contemplate what you will say before you say it. And you contemplate how you will say it before you say it. See, sometimes you can say the right thing in the wrong way. So it's not always about what you say. It's also about how you say it. <laughs> I, I usually use this illustration. Uh, it's a woman, the mother could not read, and she used to always get her neighbors to read for her. And so the son went off to college, and he wrote her a letter asking her for some money. And so... She got one of the neighbors to read the letter, but this lady was not fond of the son. And so she got to the part where he asked for some money, and the woman who was reading it said, Mother, I'm broke. Send me some money. And she said, That rascal, I ain't sending him nothing. You don't know how to ask. <laughs> About two weeks later, another neighbor came, and she said, I want you to read this letter, and I want you to see how, what my son said. And so that lady picked up the letter, and she began to read it, and then when she got to that clause, she said, Mother, I'm broke. Send me some money. And she said, well, if he had asked me like that the first time. <laughs> I would have sent it to him. So it's not always about what you say. It's also how you say it. Tone matters. Now, I'm not giving you the communication pie. 7% is the words. About 38% is tone. And the rest of it is Nonverbal. Okay. I want you to see this in Scripture. Look at Proverbs 17, 27 and 28. He who has knowledge spares his words. And a man of understanding is of a calm spirit. Even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace. When he shuts his lips, he is considered perspective, perceptive. So, here's, here's his point. A person who is not wise never thinks about what they're going to say or how they're going to say it. They just run off at the mouth because they let their spirit control them instead of them controlling their spirit. If you're going to have good communication, you've got to learn how to be in control of you. And know how to hold your tongue. And sometimes to hold your tongue, the best thing you can do is say nothing. Now that doesn't mean that you shut down. It just means that I need to think about how I'm going to respond to that. Give me a moment. Okay? That's communication. Look at Proverbs 29, 20. Do you see a man hasty in his words? There is more hope for a fool than for him. I just got to tell you. I just got to tell you. I can't, oh, it's just burning me up on the inside. I got to get it out. Well, I don't care if it's going. You know, the old preacher say, I'm going to drive this nail if it busts the plank. Well, the plank is no good then. So why are you going to drive in there? I just got to tell you what I'm telling you because if I don't tell you, it's going to make me explode. Well, well, take a deep breath and pray. God, help me to say this right because my objective is to have a good relationship. Church, here's the point. Listen to me carefully. Learning, learning is found between listening and speaking. Listening, learn, speak. Are you hearing me? Learning doesn't come from listening, speaking, and then learning. I got to listen to learn. All right. 
It is in that space of quiet contemplation on what is being said that you hear and learn the heart of the other person. I don't know if you know anything about spiritual direction. If you ever know, if you ever read anything about spiritual direction, the spiritual, the spiritual directee or director responsibility is not to say a whole lot, but to help the person who is being directed, the directee, help them to understand where God is working in their lives and to see it and identify it as such. In other words, you're not doing all of the talking. You're trying to listen and pick up on cues and to follow that. And what I'm saying is you learn when you listen. But if you always got to have the last word, you're not seeking to learn anything. You're just seeking to be right. Did you know listening is a skill? Listening is a skill. In fact, there are two primary types of listening, active listening and passive listening. Okay? What is active listening? And what is passive listening? Active listening, by definition, is the ability to focus completely on the speaker. Understand their message. Comprehend the information and respond thoughtfully. That's active listening. And I'll break that down in just a moment. Passive listening is the act of hearing a speaker without retaining their message. You are physically there, but your mind is somewhere else. For example, your mind is on something like this. How much longer is this going to be? <laughs> now you're looking right at them. I've heard that a thousand times. You're not saying it out loud. You're saying it in your heart. I wonder, I'm looking right at you. I wonder if she knows that her eye twitches every time she does that. So you're looking at the twitch and not listen to the words. I hope he hurries up. So I can get back to my book and my television show. But I'm right here. Or well, I'm physically in your presence. And I'm even looking at you. But there's dead space inside here when it comes to listening to you. Are y'all listening to me? So church, what I'm saying is listening is a skill. Well, here are the key components. And I'm going to probably have to quit here because I'm looking at my time and just got in the way. There are several key components to active listening. I think this is going to take me through. Let's look at it. Number one, get rid of all distractions. Well, what does that mean? Well, cut the television off. Put the cell phone down. Cut the computer off. Put the iPad down. Take the Apple Watch off. <laughs> Put the book down, the magazine. Stop clipping your nails. <laughs> Take your earplugs out. Stop playing the music. Kill the distractions. In communication, they call that, anything that distracts you is called noise. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Noise is not always what we think is noise. Noise is anything that distracts. So let me tell you noise. Let me show you noise. You can be talking to me, Brother Bill. You can be talking to me, Brother Bill. And a great big old black tarantula about, about, about this big <laughs> is right over there. See, that's noise. I ain't hearing nothing you say because I see that tarantula. Are y'all with me? It ain't making no noise, but it's loud. And I got to say, hey, bro, I got to move because that's distracting me. <laughs> I remember years ago, years ago, we were at a retreat, marriage retreat. And there was a big old spider in the, in the ceiling. And I kept watching that thing. <laughs> and it 
serve the Lord. And I kept watching it. And I sat in the same seat all the time. And the last meeting, somebody got in my seat. And I had to move. And lo and behold, that spider fell out of the ceiling right on me. And guess what? I didn't hear nothing that was being said right there. Oh, y'all listen to me. I start moving and looking all around and I don't know what, it, what the speaker was saying because my attention was on something else. Say man. So if you're gonna, if you're gonna have listening skills, you gotta get rid of the distractions. We're talking about if you're gonna have a deep level conversation. Number two, make eye contact without staring. <laughs> Listen, this is not a staring contest. It's not about who's gonna blink first. Huh. I don't wanna, you know, I'm talking to you. I just want you to know I'm looking at you. You so, so I'll give you eye contact, Greg. You know, even this is brother, my brother to brother, my father to son. I'm not going. Because I'm going to get uncomfortable. Well, he should be uncomfortable. <laughs> so when, I, when I'm talking to my wife, I don't be staring at her, even though she's pretty enough for me to do that. But, I, you know, I got to throw that in. Yeah, I got to throw that in. <laughs> Amen. It is what it is. It is what it is. Let me tell you this. Now, seriously, I'm not going to be staring at her. Because that's uncomfortable. I'm not blinking. You just got somebody looking at you. I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable with this. Can you blink? So what does that mean? That simply means you get attention. I'm looking at you to know, and I'm going to lean forward a little bit. If I'm sitting down, just kind of say, okay. You got my attention. That's body language. That's, non, that's nonverbal communication. It's simply saying, I want to hear what you got to say. And what you got to say is important. Mm -hmm. All right? Next one. Listen without judgment. You know what that is? I already know what she's going to say. <laughs> I already know what he's going to say here. I can finish that sentence before he finishes it. How do you know that? It may be different this time. I done heard it a thousand times. Well, you haven't gotten it in a thousand times. So maybe you need to hear it a thousand one. Go on, please. Next one. Allow your spouse to finish. One of the most annoying things in the world is to be talking to someone and you can't finish because they're talking over you. Well, I'm, I'm, wait a minute, I'm not finished. Well, you pause. <laughs> I, I, call, I, call it at least, I call it at least a seven second, a second, a seven second break. You know, if they don't speak in seven seconds, you know, sweetie, can I say something there? They got to be careful with this one because this is, this is, this is really, really, Sticky, because you might say, are you finished? But you can say that in a bad way. Are you finished now? See, that, that can come out wrong. You got to be careful. So you say, I don't want to interrupt you, sweetie. You have anything else to say before I say something? See, that's better than say, are you finished? Because now I'm going to get an attitude well, no, I got something else to say. <laughs> oh, y'all listen to me. I'm just saying what I'm saying. That's what happens. I've been doing this for 40 years counseling people. I know what happens. This is one of the hardest things to do is to listen to your spouse or any person without interrupting them. And, re and the reason that that's so is because sometimes we want to, I need you to hear me. I need you to hear my side. Your side is coming. But right now your focus needs to be on that person's side. Remember, trying to get an understanding. Amen? Next thing. Paraphrase. 
paraphrase what you heard. This is what I heard. And you repeat what you heard, just paraphrase it. I heard you say that it bothers me when you come home and I don't speak to you. I just go right into do this for me. Is that, is that what you meant? Is that what, that's what I got from that. Is that what you meant? Yeah, that's what I meant. Now we can talk about that. Because you don't end up chasing rabbits. You hear one word and your mind goes off on that. See, that ain't true. That word ain't right. I didn't do that. Instead of hearing the big story, the big picture. Are you listening? Paraphrase it. Restate it. This is active listening. Next one. Ask the question. Basically, you're saying, along with that paraphrasing, did I get it right? Did I understand correctly? Because I don't want to speak on what you are not speaking about. Okay? Next one. Acknowledge what the person has said. I got it. You're not defending yourself. You're not trying to do that at all. You're just simply saying, hey, I hear you. It does not mean that I agree with you. But I just want you to at least acknowledge that you heard me. Most fights and arguments end up being over stuff that ain't even the issue. You know, anyway, I'm going to say, say this right, right quick. In conflict management, they teach you that people usually get stuck at the level of positions. This is my position on that. But what you got to do is get beneath the position and understand what the issues are. Because once you understand what the issues are, then you may start seeing that we think a lot alike on the same thing. And now we can have a meeting of the minds. Are y'all with me? So you need to acknowledge. You don't want a person, you talk to a person. Did you hear me? Yes, I, I, I do hear you. I, I get it. I understand that. I acknowledge that I heard you. And I want you to know that I got it. That's important. All right, next. next. Express your appreciation. Appreciate you saying and sharing with me. Because I wouldn't want you to carry that stuff in your heart. I thank you for sharing your heart with me. That goes a long ways. Because again, what you said is, I want to hear you. Okay? So, I'm going to go ahead and end. I didn't get to where I wanted to get, but that's okay. Now, one of the things, well, now I got to do this one. <laughs> what not to do when you are actively listening. Let's run through these real quick. Don't interrupt the speaker. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold it right there. I don't, I, I don't agree with that. Uh, uh, no. Don't interrupt the speaker. Listen to him. Don't rush the speaker. When are you going to finish? <laughs> you know, you've been talking for 20 minutes. I haven't said anything yet. If this is about your relationship, you may have to sit 30 or 40 minutes and listen to the prayer. Whatever it takes. Next one. Don't lose your focus. Don't lose your, don't start daydreaming. Don't check out. Don't get lost in the minutia. See, a lot of times that's what happens. Give you an example. Your spouse is talking to you about getting home late. Okay? And your spouse says, you were an hour late and didn't communicate with me. And I'm thinking about something happened to you and I tried to call you out to get a response. I'm just concerned about you, just worried about you. And you were an hour late coming home. And you said, no, that ain't true. I was 59 minutes late. <laughs> what? See, you're getting lost in the minutiae. You're, you're focusing on, oh, you, you that one minute, and it's about the 59. It's about lateness. Go ahead. Don't listen defensively. 
That's what, that's what some of us do. I can't wait. This is where we, she said this, he said, this is how I'm going to respond to that. <laughs> and you're setting up your argument in your mind instead of trying to hear it understand. Go ahead. Don't make jokes, use sarcasm, or trivialize. Yo, oh, you, you, oh, that's how you feel about it? <laughs> you know. That's kind of funny. Oh, what? Funny? Well, this is over. I'm gone. Sarcasm. Trivialize what you say. I tell you something, you got upset about that? Are you serious? Don't trivialize what a person considers to be important. You're not that person. So you don't get to call it. I always use the golden principle here, the golden rule. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Don't correct grammar and pronunciation. I'm trying to talk to you, and you say, you said that word wrong. You didn't syllabicate that word right. This is not grammar English 101. <laughs> Jesus, help me, please. <laughs> you know, this preacher was preaching. This is the uh, preacher was preaching. Preacher was preaching, and, and after service, sister pulled him aside and said, you know, you made a whole lot of gram gram grammatical errors when you were preaching that sermon. I, I can write down everything you said wrong. And she said, well, he said, well, sister, you know what? If you could write down what I said wrong, you knew what I was saying. <laughs> and all I want to do is you to get the point. Right. How you got it is irrelevant. Yes, sir. Whether I said you is wrong <laughs> or you are wrong, you got it. I don't know, man. I don't want to be talking to somebody. I got to, let me make sure I say this word exactly right because I know I'm going to get corrected here. I'm not. That's not what you do in a relationship. Now, if they're in your grammar class, your English class, you grade them then. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, I, I know I've spoken about God's word, hearing God's word, and I know I've been talking about communication. Well, God is communicating with you. And God communicated the greatest, the greatest message of love in the world when he gave his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross. I want to tell you something. Love is not just a noun, it is a verb, depending on the context. It can be used as a noun or as a verb, but I want you to understand that God didn't just say, I love you. God demonstrated that he loved us in that he gave his only begotten son and put him on the cross for all of the world to see how much I love you. Jesus died on the cross. They nailed him to that cross. They crucified him. He died. They took him down. They buried him. And the third day, he rose again never to die ever again. You believe that? Do you believe that? If you believe that message, then will you this morning repent of your sins? Will you confess that you believe that Jesus Christ is God's son and we will baptize you in water for the remission of your sins? And the Lord in heaven will add you to his church, his spiritual body, and you'll be a Christian, a child of God, a member of the Lord's body. Will you come? As we stand, somebody's knocking at your door. Oh, somebody's knocking at your door. Oh, and oh, sinner, sinner, why don't you answer? And somebody.
wide on you answer. Oh, and somebody's knocking at your door. Let's just say amen. Great communication. The adequate. I'm glad uh, that Brother William preached on that sermon uh, this morning. You know, it's always good to communicate. And uh, my wife had to help me out this morning. I, I didn't, uh, I was late finding out I was supposed to be doing the confession. But I'm here, and I heard the message, and I want the church to know that it was a great, great message. Amen. Thank God. But we want you to know that the invitation is not over. If you still want to be baptized this morning, you can be. The brothers, the elders are here waiting. So does anyone want to obey the gospel this morning? Please come down front and the brothers will, will take your confession. If anyone wants to place membership, I understand that we do have one that's going to place membership this morning. Very good. We did have a couple to place membership with us after service last a week, and I'm going to ask them to stand. Brother Terrence and Sister Lakeisha Jenkins, will you please stand? Just have you stand today. Will you welcome them? They, they live in San Marcos. All the way to San Marcos and decided to make this their church home. That says something about you, us, this church, that they would want to drive the distance to come and unite with this church family. Wonderful. So we appreciate that. And they're going, uh, they're in San Marcos. I'm assuming that's care group 10. Is that correct? I believe that's going to be care group uh, 10. We also had a baptism last Wednesday night. Uh, is she here? That's her right there. Stand up. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. And I don't have the name. Can you tell what the name is? What? Edom? Well, Edom Nolan. Is that right? Yes. Soon to be, all right. <laughs> Soon to be. Don't rush him. <laughs> Very good. I tell you what. And he placed membership with stand up, sir. That's our stand up anyway. I tell you. God is God is good. In a in a time where churches are decreasing, we are growing. And who gets the glory? God. This work was done by God. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Brother Lord. Amen. And also, if you are interested in knowing more about the church, the brothers also uh, can help you with that. And not only the brothers, but all the other members out.
All right, this, with this, this lovely young lady, we're going to study with her. And uh, we're so glad that she come down and we're going to be studying with this young lady. Very good. All right. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, brothers. Also, it's prayer time. As you can see, you know, uh, about communication of God's word, how eloquent that Brother George do so. The word is being preached, and people are obeying. You know, when the word is preached in its purity, it has the power to change the hearts of men. It is happening. Amen. As we uh, spoke last week about we doing it a little different, I just want to remind the congregation that um, the prayer time, what we are uh, doing now instead of going through the categories, we know that God knows each one of our hearts. If you just need prayers, you can stand where you are. If you're not able to stand, just raise your hand, and God knows uh, what your prayer is. You need prayer this morning. Also, if you want to have your prayer request at more on uh, an intimate level, uh, again, our brother Marlon McGee does an outstanding job of getting that message out so we can pray for you individually and more, more intimate with you. And also, all of you all that are online, you can do the same. Just send your prayer request in, and we will pray for you. Let us pray, please. Heavenly Father, again, we come with our heads bowed, Lord, and our hearts continue to be humble. Thanking you, Lord, always for your many, many rich blessings. Thank you, Lord, for your preached words this morning on communication. Help us to be able to communicate with one another, with our spouses and our family, our church members, wherever we need to, to listen with our heart, dear Lord. Be quick to hear, slow to speak. We want to thank Brother George for letting God use him to get that message across to us. Help us to apply it to our life. Make application where application is needed. We pray, the Father, for those that stood. We know, the Lord, you know every one request. We know, Lord, that if there's family members that are uh, lost loved ones or ill, whatever the situation might be, the Lord, we know you know. We ask the Lord that you meet each one of us at the point of our needs. Help us to be patient, to wait on you, dear Lord. We know that you hear the prayers of your children. We just pray, dear Lord, that uh, for our building project, thank you, dear Lord, for what you're doing here at East Side. Help us, dear Lord, never to walk outside these doors and look and see what you have done and take that for granted. No, it's you, dear Lord, that's doing it. Thank you, Father. Thank you for blessing us. Help us to use that, what you're doing for us, to bring more souls to you and to serve our community better. We pray, Lord, that you forgive us for our many sins. Help us to be quick to repent because you are quick to forgive. In Christ's name we pray and ask. Amen. If you have not received a communion packet, please raise your hand that you may receive one at this time. My precious Savior suffered pain and agony. He bore it all that I might live. He broke the bonds of sin 
I'm Brother Shave. I'm up before you to administer the uh, communion and the offering after that. We understand that the Apostles' Doctrine teaches us that upon the first day of the week, you can find that in Acts 27, that's when we are to come together to partake of the Lord's Supper. And then we also find that in uh, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 11, 23, it gives us the definition of how we're to do it. Now, the reason why this was done, because the Church of Corinth, they had a misconception of what the Lord's Supper was all about, and so Paul gave them instruction. And we follow those same instructions today, but also if you look at the, what it is, it's actually a, mem a memorial. As with Joshua, when the children of Egypt crossed over the Jordan, what did he do? He erected a memorial for we could, so that they could remember. And the same thing, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper in Matthew 26, and it's for us to have a memorial to remember the sacrifice he made on our behalf so that we were delivered from sin by his sacrifice. So with that, please read with me. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 23. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself on the night in which he was betrayed. The Lord took some bread and gave thanks and uh, thanked God for it. Then he broke, the, broke it into pieces and said, this is my body which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray for the cup. Dear God, our Father who art in heaven, we thank you for this cup. We thank you for allowing your son, Jesus Christ, to come and die on the cross and shed his blood that we might have the remission of sin. Father, we thank you for his obedience. Father, we thank you for all the blessings you bestowed upon us. Now, Father, as we take this cup, we give thanks. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. You may now partake of the cup. I mean the bread, I'm sorry. The bread. <laughs> All right. Now let's drop down to uh, the next verse, which is in chapter uh, verse 25. And it says, in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. So again, let us give thanks for the uh, cup. Dear God, our Father who art in heaven, we thank you for this cup. We thank you for the shed blood uh, and a means to remission of sin. Father, we thank you for all the blessings you bestowed, uh, bestowed upon us. And most of all, Father, again, as always, we thank you for the forgiveness of sin. We pray that you will We'll take this with clean hands and pure heart. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. amen. Okay, now we come to the offering, and this is where it gets a little interesting because, again, we don't want to, we go to uh, Luke uh, 6.38, when it says, give and it should be given unto you, press down, well measured, press together. Now, we're not saying that this is a quick pro quo give to give, to get. We give because we love the Lord and it's an obedience, and we do it to honor and grow his kingdom. The Lord needs nothing from us. He gives us everything, and we're just showing our appreciation by giving back. And Paul says that we are to give as we prosper. So if you prosper, please give. So with that, uh, the brothers will now come around and uh, take up the uh, collection for any of those who would like to give. We have several ways to give, one of which is online. 
That means if you want to give online, you can. We also have Shelby Next. It's the app in which you could also give electronically. You can send it in by mail, and if you do send your offering in by mail, please don't uh, send cash. And also, you can give in person, and this is where the ushers are coming around now to collect the offering if you want to give it in person. So if everyone has had a chance to give, make sure everyone has done that. Okay. We will now give thanks for the offering. Uh, please, please, uh, please, please pray with me, please. Dear God, our Father who in heaven, we come now acknowledging your majesty and your might. Father, we thank you for the blessings you bestowed upon us. We thank you for our livelihood. We thank you for our families. We thank you for the air we breathe. Father, we thank you for all the gifts you've given unto us. We pray that we will use them in the right way. Father, we pray for those who are administering over this offering that they will uh, use it the right way. Father, we thank you for all the blessings you've given us. We pray that you continue to forgive us of our sins. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. That concludes the communion and the offering. Uh, we will now have announcements and after that to close in prayer. Good afternoon, Eastside. If you have to leave, uh, please go ahead. But if not, we ask that you would please stay. Got some important information we need to share with the congregation. I've got about three announcements that are very important, um, and uh, here here they are. Just a reminder, just a reminder, uh, those who are single, remember those who are single are going to have a meeting in the library with Brother Fillmore this morning, right after we dismiss. Also, also the uh, picnic committee has said thank you so very much for registering, and uh, at this time you can also start to pay. Okay. <laughs> So you can go through the Shelby Next app and start making payments towards the uh, picnic. Also, the last one that I've got is if you happen to see something that needs to be repaired or fixed uh, in the uh, buildings here, please fill out a maintenance form. Please fill out a maintenance form and put it in the gray box that's mounted to the wall right by the offices in this building right here. All right? That is all that I've got. Brother Davis. Who is doing the uh, dismissal prayer? Okay, we're going to ask that you just stay seated. But Harmon and I are going to have you here just for about one minute just to give some instructions to care group five and care group seven. Let's go ahead and do, have a dismissal prayer. Just stay seated. Heavenly Father, let's bow our heads. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you for uh, knowing that we wasn't able to wake up and see another day, but we did. Heavenly Father, that we pray that all the brothers here today uh, led the service and also uh, the minister for the message. Pray that we take notes and use it in our everyday lives. And also pray for the ones that's, that's uh, striving to do better, uh, to be better Christians. Also apply it as well and share it with others. In Jesus' name, let us all pray. Amen. 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 Do we have care group fives? Yeah, that's care group five.